All right, Coach Morehouse, thank you so much for your time and coming on to the Basketball Performance Podcast. I'm excited for this episode. I am too. Thanks for having me. So before we dive into the questions, can you give us a brief background about yourself? How did you get into hoops? And then how did you transition into coaching? Yeah, um, I was a good high school player. Um, I wouldn't label myself as great. Um, went to a really, really good basketball school in Hope College, uh, which I currently coach at. Um, came in the same year as uh, some couple guys that played professionally. Uh, one guy played professionally for 17 years um, and I wasn't as good as he was. So uh, the, the coach actually asked me, he knew my dad coached and so asked me if I had any interest in going into that. I did. Um, I, am, I was interested in coaching at a young age and I decided uh, to start my coaching career right then. I was uh, 19 years old. Uh, I was a student assistant coach uh, with Dr. Glenn Van Weeren, a Hall of Fame coach. Did that for four years. When I graduated, um, the college wanted to hire me, and I continued to work with Dr. Van Weeren. Um, did that for five more years, and at the at the age of 26, um, I was asked to be the head coach of the women's basketball team. Uh, they were coming off of a, a, a rough year. Uh, decided not to renew the contract of, uh, of the coach. Um, I turned them down. I said, no, uh, they came back two days later and asked me to reconsider. Um, I said, no, again, uh, I, you know, I mean, I was really young and I think I knew myself and, um, I was just a little, I mean, I, I knew how to coach guys. I think I felt comfortable with the guys. I wasn't a hundred percent sure I felt comfortable on, on the women's side, just because I had no experience in it. Um, and then uh, the day after they came and asked me, the um, the captains from the previous year's team walked into my office and said, you know, they had no idea I'd been asked. And they said, hey, you know, we, we watched you coach with the men. One of the, one of the young ladies um, was dating my student assistant coach at that time on the men's program. She said, you know, I think you could do a great job. Um, and that kind of pushed me over the edge. I went home that day and my wife said, you know, I don't know what you're waiting for. Uh, my wife actually played on the 1990 national championship team. And so, uh, you know, it was, uh, I, I, I said, yes, uh, based on those two captains coming in and encouraging me. And, um, the ironic thing is, you know, now we, we won a national championship this year. And one of those captains daughters, uh, was my cap, my best player. She was wow. the national player of the year this year and a three-time All-American. So I think, uh, you know, it was, it, it was a pretty nice deal where, you know, your former captain has a daughter that's that good. And then she entrusts her daughter with you after she talked you into the profession. And, um, you know, honestly, since the day I took the job, you know, I say, I make it sound like I was uh, hesitant to take the job. Um from the day that I took it, I knew it was the right decision. And wow. I've had a lot of opportunities to go into the men's side of coaching. Um, I've turned those down. I've had a lot of opportunities to go to the D2 and D1 level, um, turn those down. And uh, I, I just feel really good about where I'm at. I feel like I can have an impact on, um, on the women in our program. Um, I think we do a great job here of uh, not just the basketball side of things, but also the academic side of things. And um, really um, helping these women transition from 18 to 22 and then, you know, sort of catapulting them out into the world where they can impact others and sort of like a spider web spread, you know, sort of the, the mindset of our basketball program, which is selflessness and, and work ethic. Well, I mean, you built a powerhouse program there. One of the biggest accolades that you have is that you hit 600 wins faster than any coach in NCAA history. What are some of the things that you attribute that success to? I think uh, a really good coaching staff. I've always been blessed with being able to um, find people that could challenge me, push me, thought differently than I do. Um, and we're really dedicated to our program. Uh, so I'd start with our coaching staff. And then I would say, you know, the college is super strong academically and it's allowed us to really attract uh, a lot of women who might not want to pursue the D1 thing where it's, you know, it's pretty much year round. Um, our program is year round, but it's more, you're, you're gonna work on 
your own instead of having me micromanage every morning. Right. And I mean, obviously, to have a program that runs as good as yours, I'm sure culture is something that you really pride yourselves on. What are some of the things that you do to build culture at your program? What are the things that you do on the court, off the court, together yeah. in order to make sure that your cohesiveness is there? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I think we recruit the right kids. Yep. Um, you know, we don't, we don't recruit with promises and offers and things like that. You know, our, our biggest offer, I just had a conversation with a, with a woman yesterday um, who's looking at our school. I said, you know, our biggest offer is that you can come in and compete. And if you're good enough, you're going to start. If you're not, you're not. And I think in this day and age, um, that's a pretty unpopular way to recruit. Uh, I think, you know, players and parents want guarantees. Um, they want promises. And, you know, I think it, it builds a certain mindset in our program. Um, you know, we, we really believe that no one's more important than anyone else in our basketball program. Um, whenever you see our team, you'll see us in a circle, um, as opposed to me standing out in front and talking to our team. And, and that's to signify that um, I'm no, import, no more important uh, than our best player, who's no more important than, you know, maybe a player that doesn't play a whole lot or our, or our manager. Um, and I think that that mindset, which we talk about daily, really, uh, really permeates through our program uh, and how we play, how they uh, hold each other accountable, how they hold themselves accountable. Um, and then I would say the other part of that circle is, um, you know, we, we call it the, um, the we don't want anything to penetrate our circle. Right. We, we call it like uh, that's our safe zone. And in the world today, there's a lot of outside influences that are attacking culture of good teams, of good companies, right? Good companies. Mm -hmm. And I think it's greed, uh, it's social media, it's a me first mentality. And we just talk about how that circle is impermeable to outside influences, right? So we're not gonna listen to what people from outside of our program uh, might be saying to like erode our confidence. Uh, we're not gonna, we're not going to listen to the people that say, you know, we're the greatest thing in the world and, you know, have that give us a false sense of security. Um, you know, that is a, that is a very, very important part of what we do. And then the second part of our culture, I would say, is this win everything mentality that we talk about. Um, and a win everything mentality is, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you have hundreds of choices throughout the day, hundreds, right? Like, am I going to hit the snooze or am I going to get up? You know, am I going to spend my first hour and a half um, looking at TikToks or am I going to get my day started? Am I going to have a plan for my day or am I just going to kind of see where I float and where it takes me? Um, I'm walking down the hallway and there's a rapper on the other side of the hallway. You know, am I going to look at that and say that's the janitor's job or am I going to walk across, pick it mm -hmm. up, throw it away? Um, when I'm sitting in the classroom um, and a professor's lecturing. Am I going to sit in the back of the classroom or am I going to sit in the front three rows of the classroom? And I think that we're just, our habits are built on a series of little things, not one big thing. Yeah. And I think if you get a win everything mindset, um, it not only permeates your lifestyle, your academics, your basketball, it permeates your life. Mm. And so now you go about living a life of not about you, but it's about serving others, about doing the right thing when no one's watching. Uh, we call it winning in the dark. You know, when nobody's watching, um, when it's dark, when, you know, we're, when we're doing a workout and no one else is in the gym, are you winning that workout or are you kind of going 75%? It's the same thing with your studies. It's the same thing with your relationships with others. Um, you know, how do you operate when you're outside of the social media, Instagram uh, mindset, and everybody can take a picture of them doing, doing themselves something positive and good and hope that they get likes. You know, we're, we want to live in a world where our likes come internally. And by knowing that we did the right thing on that day, um, that that builds confidence in us as human beings. And then we can uh, project that confidence onto other people. How you do one thing is how you do everything almost is like kind of what I'm hearing and in, in yep. what you're saying. I mean, coach, you've been doing this for a long time now. How has your philosophy changed from when you first started off to where it is now? I'm sure dramatically, but like, can you give us a few examples of how it's changed a lot? Yeah, I, um, I would say early on, 
um, it was more about me, um, you know, and that's a little bit of the whole reason that we have the circle and things, you know, I thought I had to be the leader. I thought I had to provide all the energy. I thought um, that if they would just do what I told them to do, like we would be successful. And uh, I'm much more collaborative now uh, with our players, with our coaching staff. Um, you know, I, I really believe that, um, you know, kind of the whole win everything mindset. If, if I can't trust our players to have that win everything mindset, um, we'll be fine. We'll win a ton of games, but we won't win the game tied with two and a half minutes to go with me only having one timeout left and them having to sort of figure it out on their own. Um, I, I've got to be okay with not being in the gym and having my assistant coaches, uh, you know, lead workout, skill development. I've got to be okay with um, a player walking down the hallway with one of my assistant coaches and me not having to say to my assistant coach, hey, what were you guys talking about? I, I don't care. You know why I don't care? Because I trust my assistant coach. And so I think that's where I've had my biggest growth. Um, you know, obviously you still fall back and, and make errors from time to time, but I know I feel like I'm a much different player, uh, much different coach now than I was 26 years ago. I think I've always been relational. I think that's a big thing for me. Um, so that hasn't necessarily grown. Um, it's, I've always been good in one-on-one -on -one conversations in my office. I've always been, um, uh, I've always been encouraging of our players. Um, I've always wanted to take the kid that's really having a hard time and be there for them. Um, to me, that's the, that's the best part of my job. Talk about, you talked about getting the right people on your staff and on your team. And again, you built such a, an amazing machine there and you guys are the best school in the nation. What are some of the things that you do when you're looking for the right players to fit your program? What are you looking for in particular? Um, I think it, not doing a, not doing a background check like we all think about, you know, through the police. But I think background checks through um, people that I know in communities, people that I know in coaching, um, being willing to talk to their high school coach. And um, I mean, no high school coach is going to say that their kid is a. Uh, is, is a wing nut. Um, but I think that you can observe things. You can, um, you can gather some like examples of, you know, if a kid is doing the right thing, um, you know, every coach says, Oh, my kid's in the gym all the time. Oh, well, you know, what does a typical workout look like that for that kid? Um, you know, do they go alone or do they go with you? Um, you can start to get to the bottom of some things. And, um, you know, because I've done this for a long time, I also know a lot of people in the school systems across the Midwest. You know, I know teachers, principals, superintendents, athletic directors. Um, you know, I like to ask people from other schools, right? Hmm. So I'll ask a coach for who plays against a kid yeah. what they think of that young person. Mm -hmm. And you usually get a really good feedback from that. Awesome. Can you take us through what a year of practice and games look like for you guys? What is expected in terms of games, um, skill development, strength and conditioning? I'm curious as to what your year looks like. Yeah. Um, you know, we can just start right now. Um, so I was just, I, I was just doing a workout for myself and, you know, I walked through the weight room and a couple of our kids are in there um, and lifting, they're running on their own. Um, you know, we have a really aggressive um, cardio off season program that we developed a couple years ago, uh, that they do, you know, the great thing for me is that they don't report back to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, in the, in the summertime, they're doing it on their own. And, you know, we've got, uh, th about three different lifts that we do for our kids. We've got some that are maintenance lifts. Uh, we've got other kids that are in more like strength building, maybe building a little bit of muscle mass. Um, and then we've got other kids that is, that are going to be really, really, really like, we don't want them to get bigger. Um, uh, we, we want them to be super high reps, um, and, you know, maybe do like four sets of 16, um, you know, instead of like doing four sets of like six to eight, if we want to uh, do that. So this is sort of the conditioning time they're doing, uh, workouts on their own skill wise. Um, you know, we're really blessed to have, uh, some great tools, you know, here on our campus. Um, we've got five shooting guns. Um, we've got, wow. uh, 
couple different NOAA shooting systems yep. on our in our pro in our program. So like our kids can work pretty efficiently. Um, we're big into data, so like we'll do a lot of BMI stuff uh, two three times a year, body mass indicators. So I'll put them in uh, basically testing for lean muscle mass versus uh, body fat. Um, so that'll be quite often in the summer, in the fall. And then like at the end of the end of the season, um, once we get to the fall, you know, there's going to be a little bit more controlled lifting and conditioning program. Uh, in the summer, our kids have an app on their phone. So our strength and conditioning coach can give them, you know, a, a summer program. Once we get back, he's going to do that in person uh, as far as their strength and conditioning program, their running program. Then we get to October and, um, you know, then we start basketball practice and, you know, we're going to go typically two and a half hours a day. Um, but we'll also have a lot of kids that'll come in during the day and do conditioning work or skill workouts with our staff. So, you know, we're going to do like our team stuff during practice mm -hmm. and we'll do like shooting drills and ball handling, all that kind of stuff. But we're going to do a lot more like team five on five stuff. And then to improve the individual player, we're going to spend time um, in the, uh, in the mornings or something like that before practice with our kids, trying to get them more improved at their skill set. Um, and for me, every kid that looks differently for, um, what I do know is I don't believe in like hour, hour and a half skill workouts. Like we limit our skill workouts to 35 minutes, 40 tops. And, but they will be incredibly, um, high energy and, you know, game type moves game type shots uh you know you won't see us doing you know a ton of um stationary ball handling drills unless the kid is just a bad ball handler and we have to start from the ground up but like we want to be able to input like things that they would use in a game in our skill development so and you then we get is to yeah. yeah go ahead no, I'm just, you're getting me thinking coach, because you're talking about, you know, you guys don't do a whole lot of stationary ball handling. We don't do that as well. Um, I, I coach girls from the age of 13 on up. And then we hopefully tend to send them over to the, over to the States for college. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our ball handling is in the form of tag or with a yep. decision-making component to it. Yep. I was just going to add, you talked a lot about what things that you use in the game. Do you feel like decision making is an important part of skill development? And if so, yeah. how do you how do you go about adding that into the skill development sessions? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it's different if you do a one on one. Yep. You know, if you if it's a coach and a player, but if you can get two players, now all of a sudden, you know, they have to drive and read the coach, um, and then make make the right decision. You know, if you if you sort of fake and go towards the the shooter in the corner. You know, they have to make a decision to finish at the rim. Um, I think live finishing drills are really good where, um, you know, now they're coming at you and you, you don't just stand there, but like you try to maybe take away the right hand at the last second. So they have to do a counter move, you know, maybe a Euro step, maybe they've got to do a jump stop, a step through and a finish. Um, you know, I think you can do like, those are what I would call live decision-making drills because you have to make the right decision to get to the right finish. Um, and then I think it's just a lot of, um, you know, the more people that you can get into a skill workout, the more you can do on like decision-making with passing. Um, and that's what more, what we do once we get to practice is now we'll put them in drills where they have to read the defense. They've got to make the right decision. They might have to make like a kick to the corner. And now that person now has to make a decision. Do they get a shot off or are they closed out? Do they have to make a drive off that? Or do they just have to make the and one pass, you know, to the next shooter? That would be more like a three-man drill, right? So I think it just depends on how many players you have. But I think um, if you do too much one-on-one -on -one stuff, you take the decision-making out of it. And then you just have a kid that can dribble and can get their own, but they don't always know how to read the, the situation. We, what One of the things that really changed for us, at least, is – a lot of our skill development was done maybe one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. -on -one. All of a sudden we added four people to a skill work session, six people to a skill work session. Mm -hmm. We found that the reads when it came game time was just significantly different because they were yep. able to apply that technical skills yep. to the tactical component to it. Do you guys do small sided 
skill yeah. work sessions or are they mainly one-on-one or how, how does it work for you guys? Uh, we do both. Um, okay. I think the small sided stuff is important. You know, like we'll do a lot of stuff where we'll put, we'll go three on three and we'll put a kid on the block, maybe the opposite block and we'll give an advantage to the ball handler. Right. So we'll give them like a step advantage over their player, but they're going to get chased down by that person. So mm-hmm. the, the player with the ball has a player on them, but they're a step behind them. And now, you know, we'll say go. Now that player has to penetrate. They have to read the corner defender. Are they coming in to help? Are they, they have to read the block defender, the post player defender. Are they coming to help or do they have to rack the ball? I find that a lot of our women, when they first start, are always trying to um, be all-time passer because they think that's what they're supposed to do. And we really think that, you know, you have to rack the ball. That's what we call it when you get the ball, like, inside the backboard. Um, You have to think rack the ball and finish the ball until you're told not to. Mm-hmm. right like your mentality has to be finish score finish, first finish, finish. oh yeah yeah and so and then everything will make sense off of that yeah you know getting fouled and finishing um because you see the rim and that person's in the charge arc you know makes sense um they slide over now you can make a decision on that pass the little you know dump pass to the post player they aggressively help in from the corner right giving the ball up early enough off that help that they're not in your passing lane. You feel them coming. It's a quick, you know, pass to the corner. And now that person can get a shot off because their defender is momentum is moving toward the ball and they can't make that shift fast enough to go from moving toward you as the defender and to then get back to the corner. I think those are rhythm reads, right? You have to read, those are rhythm reads where you do those live and you start to read eyes and, and bodies. And now you start to become a better decision maker. How would you, I mean, I've seen your, um, your team play multiple times on Synergy. I've been lucky enough and it's been awesome to watch you guys. How, for those of you, for those of our listeners who have not seen you guys play, how would you describe your team? Are you guys up-tempo? Are you guys more half-court? How would you describe your team to yeah. people who have not seen um, you guys We're, I would say, I think we're, I think our ranking is like we're top five in the nation in pace of play. Um, and so I, we play fast. Um, And we're not afraid. That's another area that I've evolved. I mean, I used to, you know, old me was like, you know, don't take early threes, um, you know, get the ball to the rim. I mean, right now, if we have, if we have a good player that has the ball in the wing in transition, like we want that shot. Um, So we want to play fast. I think defensively, I think our offense and our defense are combat are compatible. Um, you know, it would be hard for us to play as fast as we do on offense and be a zone defensive team. Right. So, you know, we deny every pass on defense. Uh, we're high ball pressure. Uh, we front the post completely at all times. We try to cut the floor in half, um, you know, only on, not allow the ball to reverse to the other side, only allow the ball to get to the other side through a skip pass. So our, our defense is going to be very, very aggressive. Um, we press a little bit, I'd say 15% of the time, but I wouldn't call our aggressive defense a pressing defense. I would say it's an aggressive man-to-man defense in the half court. And then on offense, we're going to run a variety of different things. We're going to run uh, some dribble drive. We're going to run some high-low offense, which I have developed. It's sort of my offense. I've developed over um, basically 26 years. I just presented on it at the Women's Basketball Coaches Association um, Mm -hmm. at our convention. Uh, And I think... I, I don't think it's that crazy and unique, but I think a lot of other people do. And I think maybe it's a lot more than what I think it is um, just because it's got some read and react to it as well as some high low. And most people that do read and react, it's almost more five out and ours is more of a low post, high post read and react. Uh, so we're going to play fast. Uh, we're going to, we want to get the ball to the rim uh, and then play out from there, you know, kick outs for threes. Uh, we want to spread the floor. Um, and then we want to be super, super efficient. I think that if you talk to our players, like they will hear that time and time again, we almost take like an NBA mindset to mm-hmm. like shot selection okay. of, you know, threes, free throws and layups. And, you know, we abhor the, you know, 15 foot pull up. Um, and the, some of the kids on my team have the green light. 
but most of them, it's like, what are you doing? You're not good at that shot. And I think that the contested two from 15 feet is the worst shot in basketball. Agreed. So basically from a very young age, what we teach our 13 year olds is we have, we label our point value system by precious metals. So a diamond, we feel like we, is a free throw. And that's the most valuable point in basketball. Mm. We feel like that's, it's a wide open shot. And then we say it's a wide, gold is a wide open layup. And then silver is a wide open three. And then a rock, which you don't want is a contested mm. mid range. So we're very much in line with that. Um, mm. Yeah, that's but it's, a, it's good. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good way. I'm going to steal that. That's a really good way to kind of explain, you know, what your value system is as a coach. I like that a lot. Sure, sure. And it's, I mean, again, I coach high school, so it gives them a very clear perspective mm -hmm. of what they're looking for and whether that was a good shot or a bad shot. And sure. again, you talk about transition threes. I mean, there's never a better time to get a wide open shot when, when the defense is scrambling in chaos. Right. And right. I think that in the past, it's something that was, you know, looked upon as, oh, you're rushing, you're rushing. But with time, I feel like those shots slowly open up and create long closeouts and create other opportunities for, um, for ad bigger advantages to happen. But absolutely. Yeah. So, but coach, you've been so generous with your time. I, the last question I have for you is what's the impact that you want to have on your program? What is the impact that you want to have on the field of basketball? Mm. Um, impact on my program, I think is born out in it's somewhat what is going on when they're playing for us, but it's more so what is happening after they graduate. Like, for example, I went to two weddings this weekend of former players. Like for me, um, like that is, that is where I hope that my impact is felt the most and how they, um, you know, how they are in a relationship uh, with their spouse? How are they in a relationship? How do they, how do they raise their children? How do they impact the people that are around them in their friend groups? How do they impact the people in their communities? Like, I don't know if I did a good job 10 years after they graduate, 20 years after they graduate. Um, you know, that'll be the true test of what their basketball experience meant to them. Um, what, what's the impact that I hope that I can have on the game? Um, I, I, I hope that I can have, I hope that I can be approachable. I hope that people can come to me now that I'm the older guy and ask me, you know, what are things that you wish you would have known when you were 30 that, you know, now that maybe can speed up my learning curve as a young coach. Um, so I want to be approachable for that. Um, I want, I want coaches to understand that the X's and the O's and the culture uh, of your basketball program don't have to be separate. Like they can be, they can mold together to make a true pr basketball program. And I think we get it mixed up that we, we start to talk about cultures and off the court thing where we meet and we talk and we, you know, we, we have all these things that we talk about philosophically. Um, I, I, I just really think that they have to meld together um, they have to melt together and become this one thing that isn't basketball. It isn't just off the court in the locker room. It's in their lives all day long. It's what they take with them when they graduate. It becomes who they are. And so the culture and the X's and O's, the skill development, the work ethic, all of that stuff molds together and becomes who they are long term. Awesome. Awesome. And then finally, coach, I mean, you were just so approachable and so willing to do this with me, even though we went back and forth on finding times for our own time zone, yeah. where can people find out more about you? The awesome program that you guys have, and maybe even where we can find that, uh, that talk that you were talking, uh, the talk that you did. Um, so we can learn more about you. Yeah. The, um, so the WBCA women's basketball coach association. So it's WBCA.org. Um, first of all, if you're coaching women, um, in my opinion, like you should be a member of the WBCA. Mm -hmm. It is like the most important, um, professional group that you could be a part of, okay. um, as a person coaching, uh, girls, women, whatever. So join the WBCA. Um, and that's where you'll find, uh, that video. 
Um, you know, I think the other way to find more about me is just to go on our website at Hope College. So that's uh, www.hope.edu, like education, E, D as in dog, U as in university. Um, great place to find me. My email is on there. My phone number is on there. Uh, I'd like to think I'm pretty approachable. Uh, you know, I'll return information to people um, and uh, always help to, happy to help grow the game of basketball. Coach, I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Just hold the line. Thanks, William. Appreciate your time too.